The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. We're in Matthew 2 in this study, and we're looking at from, from 16 through 18 is, I took the short route with it. Um, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, it's interesting how he interprets the will of God, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, God, God appeared to them and said, look, don't go back. He's a crazy man. Go back, go, go back to him. And, and, and now he, he, he assumes that he's been tricked. Isn't that funny? He assumes that. Well, that's not true. They didn't trick him at all. They just went home a different way. And, uh, but I just, you know, he has, you know, he's manic depressed and a whole lot of stuff going on in his life. So I'm not giving him any slack or, but it's just interesting how he interprets things, is my point. Uh, tricked by the Magi, he became enraged and sent and slew all the male children who in Bethlehem and in its environment, uh, or um, not environment, but uh, in its vicinity, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had ascertained from the Magi. Verse 17, 18. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, and then he, of course, he quotes Jeremiah 31 and 15. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Now, we studied that from the historical standpoint of the prophecy. Remember, this was in Matthew 2. You have four prophecies fulfilled connected with the birth of Christ, and this, this was one of them, okay? So let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to come back, and we're going to take a look at this from the omnipotence of God. We've seen this story. We've seen this story from Herod's side. We've seen it from the Magi side. And we need to see it from the God side to get the answers. And so we'll do that after this prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. Classroom etiquette. Carnality. You can't study the Bible on carnality and get any truth from it. It's just another book until the Holy Spirit gets a hold of it and puts it in your soul in a way that it becomes truth that you can live and die by. How do I know carnality? Personal sin, the awareness of it. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or verse sins should be confessed in silence and privacy through your priesthood prior to study. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That act on your part and God's part puts you back into fellowship with the indwelling Holy Spirit who will teach you and lead you and guide you and direct you into the truth of the Word of God. I give you that moment. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the things that you will teach us about the kind of dramatic experiences in our life, crisis level, when we lose children. I stood beside my grandmother while she buried several of her sons and said, this is just not right. Parents should not bury children. I've thought a lot about that over my life, Father, and have come to divine enlightenment on it in my own life. I will share it tonight through the scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. The lesson to, that I want to bring to you tonight, I don't know if this will be the only lesson on this subject, but it's the first one for sure. The lesson will introduce answers to both of these two questions. Why did God allow this to happen? You know, if he is a sovereign God then how, how, why would he allow this to happen? And the other question, was this death part of the perfect plan of God? 
and they're, they're both very loaded questions to grieving people. They deserve an answer. The answer, and it, and it can't be a short one because it will never satisfy. And so I want to give a little longer one, and I don't know that I can complete it in this one hour, but I'm going to cover the subject matter. I think it's really important that you get ahead of the game. And, and, and for many of us, that's how this whole thing works. The lesson will introduce answers to both of these two questions from our three points that I'm going to give you tonight. It will introduce it. And that's my point. And you, how you can apply, the key is the omniscience of God. That's the key. It is understanding theologically, biblically, scripturally, the omniscience of God that you can apply to your life in such situations as these. Such as the death of children. In the previous lesson on the providence of God, we saw how the omniscience of God worked on behalf of the children. I went into links on that, the providence of God, a very key important doctrine. You can pick that up from, pre that was my last lesson. It is important to understand the God side and not just the Herod side and not let Satan off the hook in the angelic conflict. See, people get mad at God when stuff like this happens. They let him off the hook. They let Satan off the hook. I mean, they're angry about all the wrong things. So I want to try to get you ahead of the game, and I want to get you people informed on how to help people with this question. We know about the angelic conflict. Almost everybody does in the church, but they don't understand how this whole thing works. It's in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. We're not going to look at it, but verses 10 through 17, put on the full armor of God, and it's talking about the angelic conflict of your life. Now, the only place that you can put on the full armor of God and fight the devil is on earth. And you can fight him and beat him at every, at every turn on every occasion. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, 1 John 4.4. 4. Jesus beat him straight up and straight out. I mean, El Zippo, boom, got him on the cross. And when he came out of the grave, he knocked him out of the park. This thing, he should not be in having any victory over the Christian life, none. I want you to remember to pray for a pastor. I'm not going to give you his name, but I want you to pray for a pastor, an active pastor whose wife has filed for divorce on him. You know, this, this no contest stuff catches you really on a blind side. Now, it shouldn't, probably not on the blind side, you weren't having trouble, but on the blind side, I'm out. And so he asked that we might pray for him because he knows this isn't of God. But it's one thing not to know it's of God. It's another thing to know of who is it. And what is it about God that you can just write him off so quick on that deal? You know, people go, well, I know this is not of God. Well, in what way do you believe this is not of God? If you're saying, I don't believe this is of God because it's evil, then, I, you know, God doesn't tempt anybody with evil. Then I can agree with you. But just to write God off in kind of a blank slate and not understand what you're doing about this, so I want, I want to clear up some of that stuff. This lesson will help you understand the power of the omniscience of God working out in your life. Listen to me, Romans 8, 28. You will never, oh, you can memorize it. I mean, you're smart enough to memorize Romans 8, 28. God works everything together, all things together, right? Everything. You know, all things means everything. That's going to be important in my lesson tonight. When it says he works all things together for good, it means everything. And that's going to be important. And if you under, listen, I'm telling you, that's a key phrase in the omniscience of God. So that's very important. My lesson tonight should help you understand the power of understanding 
the omnipotence of God and how it works in your life, Romans 8, 28. Because this works no matter what your circumstances are. I don't care what they are. Here's the first thing. I got three points. Here's the first point. Is understanding the omniscience of God is one of ten key essences of God. These are not the only essence of God. These are the key ones. Kind of, I say it's kind of like understanding colors. There's primary and secondary. These are the primaries. Almost all theologians, Christian theologians, believe this. It's not just me. And it's not. They all, if I mean, okay. Now I'm after. Notice I've got omniscience and uh, and. Um, omnipotence and omnipresence and, and, and all these things. I'm looking at omniscience, which means all-knowing. The other means all power and all presence, immutable, of course, doesn't change, veracity is truth. This is a, a very important you understand. God cannot lie. And the devil cannot tell the truth. That's why they're arch enemies. That's why the truth destroys lies and the lies destroy truth. The sovereignty of God is a key. It's what holds it all together with strength and power and might. When we, when we talk about an almighty God, we're talking about sovereignty working omnipotence in the divine plan. The righteousness See, there's two sides to, to this idea of righteousness in the Greek language. Righteousness, there's a, it, it's, the same, it's the same word in the Greek language. It's like having a nickel and you got a heads and a tail. Righteousness and justice is a head and tail, the same concept. You got to have a righteous God to have justice. To get justice, you got to have righteousness. They're inseparably linked. In the Greek language. It just depends on whether you want them. I always put righteousness down. Because it's something that you embrace. That God give, he imputes a righteousness to you. That's a standard barrier in your life. Of course the love of God. The eternal life and holiness. I think holiness is. By far the, one of the greatest attributes that you and I understand. It's the whole key behind worship. Praise. Glory. Why people don't consider that to be part of this is. I don't know. I can tell you the psalmist David did. The angels do. They sing holy, holy, holy. I know they do. And that's why I do. Because God is all-knowing, listen to me now, this is important. Because God is omnipotent, uh, 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 omniscient, because God is omniscient, all-knowing, he, listen to me now, he anticipates every decision and every event of biblical history and designed a perfect plan in eternity past at the Eternal Life Conference. You know, I say that to people. I say it to pastors. They roll their eyes back like, where did you ever get that? Well, so I gave you three scriptures. So let's go to it. I want to start, because I want to show you some things. I want to start with 1 Peter 1. Where do you get that? I get it from the Bible. 1 Peter 1, 2021. I'm just pulling out. Some passages to give you the foundational understanding. In verse 20, 1 Peter 1, 20. For he, he's talking about Christ now in verse 19. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Your Bible might say creation. Does your Bible say creation? Yeah, some do. Some do. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world but has appeared in these last times. Look how, look how he compared those. Oh, oh, you're missing it. 
Watch this now. You, you're missing this now. He was foreknown before the foundation has appeared in these last times. He's compared it with the, the creation of the foundation of the world. The, the foundation of the world has now been uh, compared to the last times, the last days. And, yes. And, and the, the days of the coming of Christ. And why? For our sake. Do you see that? Listen, the foundation, the beginning of human time to the day in which you live are connected to your life through Jesus Christ. How would you ever believe that your life today in Birmingham, Alabama, sitting here, in 2018, is connected to the creation of the world, of significant importance, right? Because the last days are connected to the first days. Come on now, right? Don't make me work too hard. I'll just faint up here. <laughs> All right? Now, so look what he's done there. And why, and why is he, and, and they're connected to Christ, right? Because that's he who was foreknown is connected to Christ, right? And it's all for whom? This is all for whom? This whole deal is all of it for whom? Creation of the world, placing Christ there, put him on the cross, bring you into the kingdom, all of that for, for your sake. He's appeared in these last times for, your, for the sake of you who, for the sake of you who through him, for those of us who have come through Christ, for through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. This whole thing, this whole, this whole kit and caboodle was to bring you into a personal relationship with God in time that will last forever. Say forever. forever. That's not the first time you sin. It's forever. Once you're in Christ, you're there forever. Don't let anybody lie to you. You know who the author of lies is, don't you? So don't buy into him. You go to the scriptures and hunt it out. You know the only thing, the only thing that you can hold up against Satan's lie and know it's a lie is the truth of God's word. It's the only thing. Then you ask people, well, what's the Bible say? They don't have a clue. You go like, ding, ding. There's, there goes a walking cosmos diabolicus dummy. And I mean that in a, in a kind way. He's being, he, he, he is controlled by the master puppet, Tear. He's pulling his strings, man. And he thinks he's in charge. I'm in charge of my life. Listen, nobody's in charge of anybody's life. You're either in the devil or you're in God. There is not a, I'm a every time you hear, I'm my own man, I'll, I'll run my own life. You know he's, he's done. That's, that's smoked turkey. You know, that, 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 that guy's cooked. Now, here's the first one, okay? Before the foundation, I laid that out. Here's the second one. Let's go to Ephesians. Back up. Let's go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians. You're going to be so glad that God put me in bed and said, here, I got something for you when I get through with this. I don't know that I got this had I not been in bed. And he goes like, well, since I got you shut up and laid down, let me talk to you. Listen to this. I'm going to start with verse, I mean, Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And boy, does he not, does he not earn, or has he not earned the right to be blessed? Is he, listen, is he not praiseworthy? Due to the glory, is he not due his glory? Remember that when you start your prayers. You know, Father, in the name of Jesus. Listen, somewhere in there when you hit that, 
If you're going to pray, you be sure you have some Thanksgiving part in that. You be sure that that opens up into blessed. Huh? You are worthy. Tell him why you believe he is worthy to be worshipped and to be honored. And how you are blessed in the blessed. Well, anyhow. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Look at it. The blessed. Blessed us. With every spiritual blessing, that's three times. Have you got blessed three times? Right? You watch for, you watch for these key words, don't you? <laughs> Boy, I mean, they're right there. Boy, I'm setting you off in the new year right, isn't it? Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This is that positional truth. They, these are blessings all based on, on your position in Christ and nothing to do with you. Oh, look at me. I am worthy to be blessed. Just, now watch this. Here we go. Just as he chose us in him, Christ. Where? Before the foundation of the world. How about that? That we should be holy, blameless, before him, and then he goes into the subject in love. There should be a period there. See, listen, when were you chosen in Christ? And you know what that means? That means at the eternal life conference, this was all laid out. The plan of God was laid out. Laid out. And you were chosen before the foundation, of which at the beginning of human history, you were already chosen before See, the word is before. What do you mean before, Ron? Well, I mean at the eternal life conference. When God sat down with the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and he laid this whole thing called the perfect plan of God out. And, and we were chosen in Christ before there was any human race. Is he not a genius? I mean, we might have started with dogs and all kinds of things. We might have started with man's best friend before we started with man, won't you imagine? I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud a little bit. Let's go to John. John, the 17th chapter. John, the 17th chapter, verse 24. Still on the same shop. You know, you know what I'm talking about? What am, what's my subject? The omniscience of God. See, all of this has been starting to lay out before the foundation of the world, chosen to God, your, your salvation, all the blessings from time, from the beginning of human history to the end of human history. God has laid all this out, right? It's all based on the omniscience of God. This all-knowing God. Are you with me? No, I hope so. Here, here, is, here is 1724. I'm in John. Father, I desire that they, I desire, desire that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am in order that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou didst love me before the foundation of the world. The love the Father has for the Son to send him into a world the Father loved in order to send him. How about all that? Is part of the omniscience of God's Perfect plan. You know why you need to get saved? Because God has a magnificent plan that he'd like you to step into. While you're still on earth. And participate in this magnificent program. Here's the second thing. Therefore, the omniscience of God... So designed the perfect plan of God 
Now pay attention. So as to include all events and actions related to their causes and conditions. Now pay attention. As an indivisible, indivisible, indivisible system, sovereignty, that's what behind that, every link being part of the integrity of the whole. You know what this is? This is now the foundation of the world at work. Now we're in gear. Now we've got Adam, and now we've got Abel, and now we've got Cain, and now we've got... You understand? Now we've got human history in function. Now we're not before the foundation of the world. We are in the foundation of the world in function. That's what I'm talking about in point number two. Therefore, the omniscience of God so designed the perfect plan of God so as to include all events and actions within human history how they're related to the causes and conditions, it is one indivisible, uh, one indiv divisible. Oh, why? I, my mind, I'm thinking, I'm saying something else. And I keep saying to myself, no, you're saying it right. And uh, for the <laughs> Thank you, Horton. Listen to me. I'm just talking about how your life lives. That's all I'm talking about here. When we say all events and actions, that's your life. Events and actions. Causes and conditions. Circumstances. Situations. It's one unit at work. Every link in that is part of the integrity of the whole plan. He's working out from one to move you to another, to move you to another. He shuts down this and opens up this and moves you here and moves you there and jockeys you here and jockeys you there. These are the, these are the events of your life and the actions and the participations, the causes, the thing that causes and the conditions and all of that moving his plan in your life and I want you to know that stuff and know that this is good. Okay, I lost that job. It is a better one. It's a better one for you in the plan of God. May not be a better one in the human perspective, but it's a better one for you. Why? Because the omniscience of God knows things about life that you don't know that he's willing to explain to you on this journey, and this journey is all about this all the time. Events, actions, conditions, causes, holy macro. I had my day all planned out. That didn't work. <laughs> how, many, how many days? We start out the week, by Monday, I got it all laid out. I've been on, I've been on way, my way to church. I was so ready to teach a lesson, and the Holy Spirit goes, we're changing it. And I go like, I don't think so. Yeah, we're changing this. I say, what you, what are we going to do? He goes, oh, I, li I like to do such and such. I said, well, go for it, because I don't have a clue. <laughs> and so I wind up, and you think I'm running rabbits all days. And, and I am. I'm, I'm on a hunt mission. I am running rabbits. I'm hunting them. I bag one, I go like, whoa, well, that was good. I didn't know there was a rabbit there. <laughs> I don't know. But I tell you one thing. I have learned through walking in the Spirit to listen to him. I'll tell you that. I've learned to listen. I can't tell you how hard that is for me. <laughs> Two people I have a hard time listening to is my wife and God. Not necessarily in that order, but... And, and, and they're both wise. I, and they both have my... They both have... I know in my heart they both have my best interest. You think? You th and you would think, after a while, you just learn to...
Yeah, it does. <laughs> but I am learning. You would think after all these years, <laughs> someone would click. Listen, listen. Uh, let me get back on the trail and quit hunting. Notice the use in Ecclesiastes. Will you turn to Ecclesiastes 3? Ecclesiastes 3. I want you to pay attention to one word. This word is the dynamics of Ecclesiastes 3, and it deals with the omniscience of God. And it deals with point number two. All the events and actions and causes and conditions that are occurring in your life or tumbling you through life, tumbling you out of one and into another and pushing you down the road and pulling you back and all of this stuff. Listen to me. Are you in Ecclesiastes 3? All right. Look at verse 1. You say, see the word everything? You see the word everything? Huh? Look at verse 13. See the word everything? Verse 14, see the word everything? Or all things? In verse 19, everything or all things? You see that? What a, I, I, my Bible's the only one that does that? Or are you just not responding? Yeah, you, you see it? You see the word everything? Or all, the, all this? All, all these? All this? Well, shoot. They could, it could say all this or something like that. What everything in verse 1, I, of course I got to do American, uh, verse 13. Eleven, okay. Uh, okay, maybe it's 11 then. You always want to check my numbers, people. And then verse 14, see the word everything? Let me write that down, I'll forget it. Um... Let me get, make sure I change 13 to 11. Verse 14 says anything. Anything, okay. Everything. Everything. And then 19. Right. Everything. Okay. It, it could say all. All. I, I, you're, on 19, you may have a little problem, and I'll clear it up with the Hebrew, okay? The key to this whole thing in, in Ecclesiastes is dealing with the omniscience of God as it works out in his plan. For example, verse 1, there is an appointed time for everything. There is a time for every event. Do you understand that? And then it goes through a whole list. Now, see, that was my definition, Right? The events, the actions, the causes, the conditions. Um, he has made everything, verse 11. Thanks, uh, uh, Charlie, you were, you were absolutely on that in verse 11. He has, he has made everything appropriate in his time, right? That's what he said in verse 1. He has also set eternity in their hearts, and he goes on to that subject matter. Then we drop down into 14. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to be added to it. There is nothing to be taken from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him or reverence him. Drop down in verse 19. And this is what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about, verse 19. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. One dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath. There is no advantage for man over the beast. But here is what this actually says. And I wrote it on your paper so that there would, there, there would not be a con confusion about it. Everything is meaningless. That's a key word in the book. Now, those of you that went through the book of Ecclesi uh, Ecclesiastes with me know that. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. That is the word meaningless. That is the word meaningless. 
everything, all, everything is meaningless. Now, what the writer wants you to understand is a contrast between verse 14 and 19. The difference between, in verse 14, you got divine viewpoint to life. In verse 19, you have cosmos diabolicus. Divine viewpoint is God's system at work. Cosmos diabolicus is the devil's system at work in opposition to the divine. Are you with me? Satan opposes God. God opposes Satan. All right. Look at verse 14 on your paper. This Ecclesiastes 3.14. I know that everything God does will remain forever. forever. Boy, isn't that good? Why would you not invest in his bank? Would that be a good investment? Uh? Will may, remain forever. There is nothing to add to it. There is nothing to take away from it. I know that everything God does. See, omniscience has planned it. And now God executes it. You understand that? Now, he does it through the Son. He does it through the Holy Spirit. He does it through I mean, He's got a lot of ways he executes it, right? You can see at the birth of Christ. I mean, he pulled, he pulled, he threw the hoe. He threw it all out there, didn't he? I mean, he used, used his top guys. I mean, he, was, he sends uh, uh, Gabriel and the, the, uh, the military choir, right, yeah. to the shepherds. Of all the people, sent them to the shepherds. But we know what kind of people they were. I mean, he, he, he brought the Tabernacle Choir. You know, <laughs> what I know? He brought them out, man. Now listen, look at God mentioned twice. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it. There is nothing to take away from it. For God has so worked that men should reverence him. That's why he's worthy. Now, look at verse 19. I, I mentioned on my paper the New American Standard Bible doesn't clarify an important teaching point of Cosmos Diabolicus. And I, the ha on the word ha kol, see, that's the word everything, ha kol, that's a definite article with the word all, is meaningless, is kabel. Now, kabel is a very famous word, I mean, especially in the book of Ecclesiastes. In the book of Ecclesiastes, that, that, that most people talk about it, they, it's translated in English, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. But it's meaningless, meaningless, it, empty, empty, everything is empty. That's cosmos diabolical, it's philosophy. God didn't create the world that way. He didn't create us that way. It's used, this word, this word, habel, is used 37 times in this book. 37 times. I used it as the benchmarker for my study when I did Ecclesiastes. I, 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 I did all my lessons around it. Meaningless, you say, here, here's meaningless. Here's meaningless. Here's the cosmic system. See, the one thing God is not is meaningless. He is meaningful. But see, the devil takes a word and he twists it around and lies about it because he can't tell the truth. He wouldn't have the truth if it bit him, as they say. Meaningless, meaningless is out of control, chaotic, proof that God is not in control of anything. That's meaningless. And when you read Isaiah 45, 18, you find out that God did not create the world that way. He, he created it with, with meaning. He didn't create us meaningless. But it's another lie of the cos cosmos diabolicus. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is, not, God is not the author of chaos, but of peace and order. John 8, 44. The very essence of the devil, like God had, I put God as omniscient and, and veracity, for example. Mm. The devil has essence. The devil's essence is lies. 
He lies all the time. Therefore, his essence is liar. You know, liar, liar, pants on fire. That's how they will be. She said they will be. Yeah, in Revelation 20, when he's thrown into the lake of fire, you got that right. Listen, Ecclesiastes 3.19 says, life without God in Christ is meaningless. There's your point. Life without Christ is meaningless. You want one message out of the Bible? You read the Bible through. Life without Christ is meaningless. Without Christ, life sucks. There you go. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Suck it in. Yeah, it sucks in lies. Yeah, you shut down on God and you got nothing less but to pull in lies. You get, you're going to be fed from one system or the other. Life with God in Christ has perfect meaning. And the omniscience of God is planned it that way. Nothing to add to it, the, the scripture says. Nothing to add to it and nothing to take from it. How, I mean, how good is that? How good is that? In verse 3, while God does not cause evil or sin to occur, he does restrict it because of human volition and the angelic conflict. He restricts it. You can read this in Job 1 and 2. In Job 1 and 2, now, we're not going to read Job in 1 and 2, but we've studied a lot. You remember when he goes before the court and all that? See, that, that's the angelic conflict. And it's about, human, it's about human volition or what we call free will. In James 1.13, it says, Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anybody with evil. Job 34.10 says that. It, uh, one of Job's little friends say that. For me, one of the signals of spiritual growth maturity is when the believer is able to discern and to apply the doctrinal principle of, birth, of point three. It, it ought to be a signal within your soul. I've grown into a state of maturity where I understand that God does not cause evil or sin in my life. He does restrict it because of human volition. And how does he restrict it? Well, here's how he does it. He designed three classifications of his will to be applied by free will, by human will, free will, volition, human volition. There, it's called the directive will, the permissive will, and the overruling will of God. We see it in the life of Jonah. Well, you see it everywhere once you understand it. You see it in the garden. You see it everywhere once you understand the principle. The directive will of God, he says, this is what I want you to do to Jonah. I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach to them the gospel. He salutes, gets on a boat and goes the opposite way. God permitted it. Let's him get out in the ocean pretty good distance and then puts, puts, it, puts himself into action with it. See what he's going to do with it. So he puts his life in a little bit of stress, doesn't he? Called discipline. So what are you going to do with it? All he does is bow his back. So he wrenches it up a little bit. He bows his back. There was him overboard. Let him sink to the bottom. He bows his back. But he seems to be softened up a little. So he lets a big whale come by or a big fish, whatever, and scoop him up with orders not to eat him, just to swallow him. For three days. Talk about the big war going on between God and the large fish. Don't eat them. Hold the bait for three days. 
then I'll let you know. And on the third day, up from the grave he arose. Right? Up, uh, right, up from the grave he arose. For most of us, we'd, if, we'd, if, if we had been raised from the dead, we would have believed that God put a, a new lease on our life, that God had some big plans for our life, wouldn't we? Now, God, you can count on me. When you give me an order, I'm all over it. You give me a second shot at this thing. You need to read chapters 3 and 4 to see how that deal went. And you know what? We, don't, we never hear of this man again until Jesus talks about him, and then he only talks about him in the grave. Then he, you know, take advantage of your second chances at everything. Second chance in your marriage. Second chance in business. Second chance in your health. Second chance with your family. Second chance with, with what God has purposed in your life. A second chance. You don't, don't, don't stretch this thing out to fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, 26. Don't do that. Don't do that. Why? Because you're in, because of Christ, you're in a perfect plan. The omniscience of God has planned out your life out of time and into eternity and it was done before he ever began the human history story. You were important to God. Because of the omniscience of God, every decision, event of human history, everything in Ecclesiastes, was designed into a perfect plan in which every believer of the gospel of Jesus Christ enters at the point of salvation. See, we learned that in Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. See, it would be good. For people to know that when they lose a child or their, their life is turned upside down. Like my grandmother who says, it's just not right that parents bury children. And I knew what she meant. She it wasn't a slam on God. It's just, this is not the way it's supposed to work in human history. This is not the way it's supposed to be. See, it's important to know then how that it, it is the way it's supposed to be. Because it's part of the perfect plan of God. That all things work together for good. Every, everything. Not just some things, but everything. Let us pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we're, we're thankful for you putting on my soul the importance of explaining to people whose life are turned what they would consider upside down the natural order maybe of life very successful businessman and now his business was stolen from him or whatever. It's just not right. Yes, from a human perspective, but from a divine perspective, how am I to see this as a Christian? I look through the eyes of the omniscience of God and understand what that means in regard to the plan of God as, a, as it unfolds my life into his plan. Oh, Father, help us understand the importance of the mechanics that we might find or consider or count it all joy count it all joy no matter what our circumstances they don't dictate our joy our joy comes from you 100% pure joy 
that overfloods our soul and others can see it. At the birth of Christ, we celebrate a joy to the world, a Savior. What a magnificent plan that we are part of today. Encourage our hearts, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.